Celtics Ready Podcast. Hello and welcome, everyone. This is the Celtics Reddit Podcast, episode 153. I'm calling it an off-season temperature check. For this episode, I'll be your host, Celtics J, filling in for Mr. Ben Vallis, a.k.a. user Brutal Gash. I'm joined today by fellow Celtics Redditor and OG of OC, the green side of the spoon, the man who has promised his mind to the Marcus Smart Hive should he make the 2022 All-Star team, Mr. Wayne Spoony. Spoons, thanks for being here. How we feeling? Doing good, Jay. A uh, little nervous about the bet, the ongoing Marcus Smart bet. Uh, if I have to become a full convert to the hive, uh, that could really hurt my uh, objective street cred, you know, on the internet. So it's going to be a big change, but I'm almost kind of looking forward to it, it deep down, you know? Listen, you got to have some skin in the game one way or the other. You got to right. take a stand. All right. We can't all just sit on the fence. So, some of us got to fall on one side of that thing, whether the grass is green or the dirt's dry and brown. I don't know. <laughs> so we'll find listen, out. As, uh, as NBA news has kind of slowed down a little bit, it seemed like a good opportunity to take a temp check and see where we're at, most especially with regards to the anticipation for training camp, preseason, and opening night. That continues to grow. Some of the dust has started to settle. Some questions have been answered, but some new questions have certainly emerged as well, not the least of which including our ongoing debate regarding Marcus Smart and his inevitable ascension to becoming an all-star. <laughs> On Sunday, I posted a poll in the Boston Celtics subreddit asking the question, what are the most interesting Celtics-related topics that have not been discussed to exhaustion yet? The poll got 855 votes, and last I checked, the top vote-getter was the potential of Ime's impact. So I've got some thoughts on this, and I pulled a couple of comments from the thread to share and respond to, but first, Spoons, I want your take on this. What are you expecting to see on the court that we can recognize early as a fingerprint to the impact that Ime Udoka will intend to have on the Celtics team? Uh, so I think first, and I don't, I think a lot of, sort of the effort issues we had last year can be chalked up to COVID and the crazy schedule. But the first thing I'm going to look for is effort outside of Market Smart and Aaron Neesmith. We know those two are going to bring it. Uh, but other than that, I mean, we've talked a lot about he's a, he will coach these guys hard. He'll get them playing hard. Uh, you can instill effort on day one. Right. If they're going to play hard for him, they're going to play hard for him day one. It might take a little while to put the defensive systems in. It might take a little while to put the offense in. But effort's the first thing I'm going to look for uh, to see if, you know, his voice is really being heard in the locker room. And the second thing I'm really interested to see defensively, Brad was a switch heavy, switch everything, scramble around system. The Nets did a lot of that. Uh, so I'm interested to see if he thinks we got the personnel to institute and keep doing a switch heavy uh, scheme. I think we do. I think he will. But uh, I'd really just kind of want to see what, you know, he's a quote unquote defensive minded coach. So I, I want to see what his defense looks like. So pulling in a comment from that thread, user Pebbly Jack Glasscock, you can't make up <laughs> some of these usernames. You just can't make them up. <laughs> I didn't read it yet. That's that's a great uh, one. Pulling directly from that thread, we haven't exhausted what Ime may bring because right now the canvas is mostly blank. It's all guesswork. That said, I'm going to guess that at the All-Star break, we'll begin to worry Ime isn't good at X's and O's offensively while running out a top five defensive juggernaut every night. Popular topics will include why is Richardson playing so much and why can't Cantor play more? I tend to, I, I like this comment. I think it, yeah. it's, it's practical. It makes sense because it, it's right. I mean, we can only sort of unpack and, and try to discuss Ime Uduk as a coach for the Boston Celtics so much until we see some kind of product out on the floor. And it definitely makes sense with everything we've heard to this point and everything that we've grown accustomed to with Brad Stevens that these are the types of questions we might anticipate midway mm -hmm. through the year. Coming into this so far, we've heard a lot about 
how we can expect Ime to connect with players, be a motivator, be a, a player centered coach and really help bring a certain kind of cultural and just like edge dynamic edge has kind of been one of those buzzwords being used yep. edge. Um, what's the other one there? I use an edge toughness. and toughness. Grit yeah. is Grit. another one. Yeah. Yeah. So really looking at sort of that interpersonal personality dynamic yeah. to the team. Um, whereas Brad, right. Really built his, his brand as a coach on being an effective X and O's guy. And being able to, you know, famous for out of timeout plays um, and, and coming up with unique ways of taking advantage of skills and, and talents that players had, especially when maybe not armed with the most elite talent in the league. Case in point, Isaiah Thomas, perhaps. Jordan Crawford. So, um, yeah, it makes sense. And then like what you're saying, you know, it might take a little bit of time for him to really get those systems established and in place. But nonetheless, that seems to be what that calling card is going to be for Ime. Yeah. That being said, um, I know you spend a lot of time looking at play sets and recognizing especially different players on the team currently what kinds of sets they're effective in. Um as far as X and O's go, what do you think we're likely going to see early on from this EMA squad? Do you expect to see some of the same types of sets that we saw with Brad, or do you expect an entirely different bag to this whole thing? So he's preaching a lot of ball movement, uh, which I like. Everybody wants ball movement. Uh, and I think, you know, if he can get that message across, uh, I think our offense will look a lot better better consistently with that said our offense looked fine when rob williams was on the floor uh playing with our starters and al horford is a a billion times maybe two billion times better offensive player than tristan thompson (laughs) i think some of the issues last year were just simply personnel we had so many offensive zeros that it's five guys on two essentially with the jays just trying to make whatever the hell they can do you know, they can make happen happen. Um, there seemed like there was times where one of the Jays would kick to Grant, who'd pump fake twice, and then the offense would stop, and he'd just kind of hand it back to him with six seconds. Like, wh- how are you supposed to have a ball movement offense with that going on? So uh, I, w- I would like to see, and I wonder if we'll see uh, some of the types of plays that Brooklyn ran to get Durant in sort of that mid-high post area especially for Tatum. If you look, he gets so much attention if he catches the ball in the mid high post or the low post with his back to the basket. I mean, you can probably have a functional offense just posting up Tatum every time because he gets so much help. He can just kick it and then you just have, you know, rotations going on and then you can get the drive and kick game going. And Jalen's unstoppable against a rotating defense. And Smart will pick a rotating defense apart with his passing. And uh, so will Horford. And Rob will just dunk on your head. So I'd like to see Tatum operate in the post a lot more next year. He had about two posts up a game last year. And he was good at them, fairly good at them. Uh, but if he's a more willing passer out of that, he will he will be able to really... That's just an easy way to generate offense quickly. A lot of people have talked about the Jays pick and roll, you know, one Jay picks for the other. I'm not a huge believer in that. I think it makes more sense to run a pick and roll with Marcus Smart, who's going to have a tiny little point guard on him. Uh, and Smart can beat a big man off the dribble. And uh, if the little, you know, if he gets the switch and if they play drop, Smart can make a play. Um, so. You know, if we're going to put the ball in Marcus Smart's hands, let's put the ball in Marcus Smart's hands and let him pick the defense apart with his passing uh, and let the, you know, Jason and Jalen kind of be the, okay, I'm catching the ball against a rotating defense and they'll be completely unstoppable. Um, But to Pebbly Jack Glasscock's point, I mean, we don't really know. He didn't run the offense in Brooklyn as far as I'm aware, and he didn't run it in Philly. So I'm interested to see what he comes up with. And transitioning to another comment from that thread uh, from I Hate Clutch Sports. I don't think there's been a serious discussion about Ime being able to continue what Brad did here while coaching. Everyone's kind of just assuming he's going to be great and all that, but like finding good coaches is hard. 
There's a reason young Brad was already one of the longest tenured coaches in the league. It's hard to find a good coach that consistently churns out good results and steps up his coaching game in the playoffs. Despite the qualms about Brad not managing egos, the best or not, always calling timeouts quickly enough, he was largely a brilliant coach. I don't think it's safe to assume Emei will be anywhere near as good as him until we see the team in action. I think that's a fair point, and it brings me to another question, which is, how are your expectations for Ime Udoka different than they were for Brad when he took over? Uh, well, I think the team, I'm, I'll be honest, Jay, I'm terrified. Uh, not of Ime personally, but changing a coach when you know you've got a very good coach with two guys that are about to hit their prime. Like, if we don't get this right, this could be an absolute disaster. So I am completely terrified. I think we have to make the second round next year, uh, barring, like, you know, catastrophic injury uh, to one of the Jays or something like that, or we're just super banged up and never have a full lineup. But if we're fairly healthy, I think we absolutely have to make the second round, or I'm going to start getting worried, frankly. So that was another question I had for you, which was, what's a successful season for Ime Odoka look like? Is that making the playoffs? Is that enough? Is it getting to the Eastern Conference Finals? Is it getting to the finals and at least being in that, you know, at that level? Are we looking for that type of immediate impact uh, for him to sort of, at least from the perspective of the casual fan base, having a successful impact? Um I you know I think about when Brad had started right like that was it was clearly rebuild time yeah <laughs> we had just shipped out you know our our core veterans KG um Paul Pierce even Jason Terry we were clearly invested in you know incoming draft picks and and young talent that could be potentially down the road turned over into stars here we are now at this seemingly similar but also uniquely very different set of circumstances that Ime's walking into where you know we're retooling for sure yeah um we are transitioning from having these veteran stars to now these emerging young stars in in J Jason and Jalen um but he's he's clearly got more in the cupboard right now than Brad did coming in um and he's oh, coming in far. with different cachet too he's coming mm -hmm. in with NBA coaching experience, albeit not head coaching, but as an assistant with the successful, having successful runs in San Antonio, having been in really competitive teams with the Sixers and with the Nets, um, and, and also having got the, you know, sign off and approval of key players on this team. I like the point that John Corrales made on the pod, uh, Last week, you know, shout out to again John Corrales for joining us on the pod last week. And anyone that hasn't caught that episode yet, make sure to go back and check definitely. it out because he definitely dropped some gems in there. Um, but I like how he brought up the point that the the key players on this squad right now, the core that we've got, they signed off on on Ime Udoka, and so you'd have to at least have some level of assumption that these guys are going to be invested in trying to give him as much as they've got to help him be successful. I think for me, it's not enough just to make the playoffs with this team. I'm, Agreed, you know, yep. we saw last year when they were crippled by all sorts of unfortunate circumstances, they still got their way into the playoffs and they got the, the worst matchup. They went up against, you know, as, as healthy a Nets team as anyone had seen in the playoffs. And I mean, they gave them hell. I think game. so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, game. they, it's all, you know, they did okay yeah, as I, well as you could expect. Time Lord had some, some defensive posters on Harden. Mm -hmm. I love that. Right. Yep. Like that's good stuff. And Romeo Kyrie. made an appearance and like, he almost seemed like a viable player. Yeah. Um, Naismith came out and, and hit some shots and hustled in a way that was noticeable to, to everybody paying attention. So like there were some highlights for sure, but that was a team that by all accounts, was sort of already tapped out. Mm -hmm. They were exhausted. They weren't totally bought in. It just not everything was not in sync. It wasn't gelling. Your second best players out. I mean, what are you going to do? What are you right? going to do? Yeah. So this year, it's you know we're at least in the position right now where we can expect everyone starting the season off healthy, which we haven't really I think been able to say that 
in a good handful of years now. No. So that's kind of scary in its own right because we're not <laughs> We're not used to being able to expect that. So knock on some wood. Um, but he's got a healthy roster to start with. He's got players that have sort of their own stake in this now, having signed off on this coach coming in, Ime Udoka. Um, he's got essentially a whole new staff that he's built around himself. I mean, he's holding on to Joe Missoula. Um, who's an assistant who's worked his way up in the organization. He started off with the, the Red Claws and worked his way on to the main squad. Most notably, he worked with Langford, specifically on that shooting with the paddles the, on his the hand. The paddles, yeah. Um, we also, he's kept on Matt Reynolds, who was previously the video coordinator, and now he's the special assistant to the head coach. Um, we might at some point have to dive into figuring out what that is because it kind of makes me think of the office. Um, I like, yeah, special assistant too. Let's <laughs> get him on the pod, Jay. <laughs> we got it. We got to get man on so he can just give us some clarity yeah. on that. But then, you know, some notable additions that he may specifically made bringing on Tony Dobbins, also a former player. Most of his career was overseas, but a lot of experience there. Will Hardy, who comes from that Spurs alum as far as coaching. And then, um, Maybe most notably, Damon Stoudemire coming My over, guy. former player, former rookie of the year, high level performer at that point guard role. Um, so I loved we've got Mighty Mouse. A I lot loved of, him. A lot of new dynamics to this coaching roster. Ime's coming in with, you know, y- you can't imagine a new coach having more support than Ime's going to have because not only has Brad always sort of demonstrated a, a pretty egalitarian leadership style but i also have to figure given his experience coming on as a new coach in the nba being supported the way that he was with ainge and having been given so much autonomy and support even when things weren't going well you have to imagine he's going to exercise a lot of those same at least you know foundational philosophies with ime so you have to imagine ime is going to have every opportunity to be successful it's really going to be does his recipe for success actually produce you know a a winning basketball team so yeah your your thoughts on that then you know just you know having you looking at a new coaching staff players that are bought and invested the the sense that that higher level leadership is fully behind and going to give him the room that he needs and the support that he needs to to be potentially successful you know are we putting too much hope and and optimism on what he can accomplish in year one, should we temper those expectations some? I, you know, there's there's history that goes both ways. I think sometimes teams are reinvigorated by kind of a fresh voice, and I think other times the guy just can't cut it as an NBA head coach, no matter how good of an assistant he was. And I think to your point, Jay, he is set up to be successful. He's got a solid fairly veteran roster with some young upside on it. Uh, and I, I, you know, everything that's being said and he's saying sounds awesome. But I've got some quotes for you, Jay, that I want to walk through here. And these are uh, quotes that sound very similar to things we've heard about Ime Yudoka. And I will reveal who they're about at the end. Oh, so you're quizzing me now. Uh, qu- yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> All, right. All right. So the first quote, this was an extensive and thorough search. And when we reached the conclusion, we felt strongly that the coach is the right coach for us and at the right time. GM added, he comes from a winning background, has experienced championship success, is innovative in his communication skills, along with his positivity and along with his positivity are tremendous. We all look forward to a long, successful partnership in helping the team move forward. Sounds great, right? Sounds awesome. Quote number two. Before the coaching search started, the GM mentioned that he was looking for a solid communicator, and he went as far as saying that communicating well with players was his top thing when looking for qualities in the team's next head coach. Sounds an awful lot like what Brad's been saying, right? We're looking for someone to connect with the players, a good communicator. Last quote. We looked at a couple different characteristics that we wanted out of our coach. One was a winning pedigree, the GM said. Someone who has won, whether it be as an assistant or as a head coach in any league. If you're getting to the top consistently, 
We put that as a super important characteristic. Again, Ime, oh, Brooklyn, Philly, San Antonio, this winning pedigree, right? We've said similar things about him. Like he hasn't won as a head coach, but he's been there as an assistant. So do you know who these quotes are about, Jay? So at first I thought that I did, but then one of the quotes is referencing having, it sounds like one, uh, yes. won a championship. And so that Just, actually, that threw a wrench into my gears. Cause I was thinking, man, is, is, are these quotes right now? about doc rivers and that's a good guess but so that, no. that would yeah that was basically that's where my head was originally going okay. but i feel like i'm probably wrong much worse these oh, are about no. these are about no. nate bjorkren that the pacers hired last oh, summer man. and had one of the worst head coaching seasons of all time okay. that's why i'm terrified okay because as good as it seems and as great as you know he can say what he wants to do some guys, as good as they are as people, as awesome as they are communicators, are just not good head coaches. Mm. And I hope and I think he will be, but there is a possibility he's not, and that would be a freaking disaster. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Yo, you got me with that. You yeah. got me with that. So, and I think the, the, one, the one thing, just to go back to quickly, um, and again, to touch on the, some of the concerns that were mentioned by user I Hate Clutch Sports here, when we're thinking about, especially just comparing the tenure that, that Brad has had and how we measured that success in EMA, I mean, there's, there's some parallels and similarities, but I, they are coming in sort of at different points in the team yeah. development and team building dynamic. Um, and again, I just don't think it can be overstated that the way these players seem to have off the bat signed off on this mm -hmm. does, at least for me, give me a sense of ease in knowing effort probably isn't going to be the issue, especially right out of the gates, right? Like I'm expecting these guys, if nothing else, just to come out talent and, and, and skills blazing, if only because they're really personally invested in, in helping Ime be successful and, and showing not just the Celtics organization, but the league as a whole um, that, you know, Ime as well as a lot of the other, uh, you know, coaches that, that just got hired this, this past year um, have been waiting too long for some of these opportunities. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I am, like I said, I, I'm bullish. I think even if effort and the amount of talent we have will be a pretty damn good team. So I don't think it'll be a Nate Bjorkman level disaster, but uh, I just wanted to put, you know, a little like, uh, just a little red flag. Like it's a good go point too though, crazy. because these, the PR team is going to do its job, right? Yeah. And they've got to sell a product. And the Celtics yeah. team is ultimately, it's a, it's a commercial product. And so they want to make sure they've got fans watching the games, filling the seats, buying yep. beer and nachos and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, we, we do have to be careful not to fall into, you know, typical sort of media tropes in how we analyze and, and get amped up for the oncoming season. Speaking of uh, loose journalism, all right, this <laughs> is a great segue, up. great segue to considering a couple of, uh, uh, of journalism uh, tropes that are reemerging here, uh, presenting itself as news, maybe not so much. And what I'm referencing are a couple of posts in the sub that are talking about Zach Levine as a potential target uh, in the upcoming free agency next year. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I saw another post come up where just generally talking about Jeremy Green and that the Celtics had made um, some efforts to to pursue that and and trying to get Jeremy Green on this team. Grant, uh, Jeremy Jeremy Grant. Sorry, special moment. <laughs> so, uh, get Jeremy Grant in Celtic Green. There we go. <laughs> uh, so let's start with with Zach Levine because that's the bigger name guy. You know, when we're talking about getting a third star, as it were, um, he better fits that aesthetic uh, than Jeremy Grant does. One of the comments that I pulled out of the thread um, on the sub was from Diddy Stop Please. And the comment was, he's been, rough, he's been a rough defender for Chicago the last couple of years, mainly because he's expected to carry the offensive guard, the opposing team's best player. 
If you watch the Olympics, when he's allowed to play off ball, he really is an incredible defender. We know Zach Levine can score, and we especially know he's electric when it comes to you know, getting out on the break. He can rise above the rim. He's a, he's a pretty solid finisher. His shot has improved over time, so he's a oh, pretty yeah. you know, lethal guy from distance. Uh, your thoughts on first Zach Levine as a star level player to begin with, and then your thoughts on, regardless of whether it's realistic or possible, just your thoughts on how he would fit in Celtic Green. Yeah, uh, I, I really, I think I'm probably higher on Levine than most. I mean, he's like 25. He's gotten better every single year. He's absurdly athletic and. I think uh, Daddy Stop Please makes an excellent point. When he is not required to hold, like, to carry the entire offensive load, the guy could defend. I mean, it's the Olympics, right? It's not like he's defending James Harden out there, but at least he's got sort of that effort and that level in him. Some guys just don't, right? They sleepwalk on defense, and it does not matter what the stakes are. Uh, So I would, I don't think Levine's... Yeah, right. Like Arden. Uh, I don't think Levine's a very good fit uh, just because he's like basically the same type of player as Jalen. And I think uh, you want your stars to have a different mix of skills, in my opinion. But ultimately, he's really, really fucking good. And I would take him in a heartbeat if you were available. So uh, that brings up a good point, and it brings up another comment that I pulled out of that thread from uh, Pepe Silvia 11. So another wing we need far, far less than an established big. I really don't get it. And I'm sort of in a similar mindset where when I'm thinking about adding more talent to this team, I'm looking at areas where we have a lack of talent, right? And I'm looking to to bolster that up a bit. Our our wing positions are solid, whether Jalen or Jason are, are between, you know, two and three. Um, that talent level is really high. And, and Marcus Smart at the point guard, if you're confident you're rolling forward with Marcus at the point, regardless of whether he ends up an all-star and, and being that third star in his own he's right. He's fine. <laughs> yeah. Right. He's, he's, he's holding good. It down. And you could, yeah. I mean, he's, he's a legit starting point guard. No doubt. Until proven otherwise. No doubt. So, right, you've got an up-and-coming young guy in Robert Williams. You've got an established big man in in Al Horford that can, you know, ideally give you backup center minutes. Maybe he's going to still be viable at the four a little bit, but I'm not counting on that. So when a guy's name like Jeremy Grant gets brought up, that actually piques my interest a little bit more, similar to to how Pepe Silvia 11 is feeling. I'm like... Hey, if we could get a legit four to pair with these guys, and, and in previous pods, I've brought up the idea of even going after a guy like um, the the gentleman they got up there in Toronto, um, Pascal, oh, Pascal Siakam. Yeah, not a perfect fit, but again, like if you're going to look to to round out this squad, I think you're looking at like a a a decent, you know, three and D kind of big that can take some def- defensive pressure off of the Jays. Right, no doubt. hold things down a little bit more in the post, so that Tatum or Brown, either one of them, aren't having to bang with bigger bodies. Um, Jeremy Grant could be an interesting guy if the price is right there. Um, thoughts on Jeremy Grant, and if if you're not down with potentially adding Grant, tell me why. If you are down with it, tell me what you'd be willing to give up for him. Yeah, I. Uh... I, I'm probably unlike Levine. I'm probably a little bit lower on Grant than a lot of people are. I think he kind of had a paper tiger type of season last year. I don't think he's as good as his numbers looked. That said, man, he'd be a good fit in Green, dude. He would be so friggin' perfect as the third wing next to the Jays. I mean, he does all the stuff we don't want to have them do. And he can knock down open corner shots. He can, you know, he can handle it a little bit. He can pass it a little bit. He's super versatile on offense. I mean, he's not like elite at anything on offense, but he's good enough that he can kind of take advantage of mismatches and and things. And that dude can defend. And he's he's bigger than I kind of previously thought, man. He just looks freaking big out there. Um, so what I would give up for him, um, 
man, that's that's really tough. So he makes a lot of money. So I mean, you'd probably have to say Al's probably got to be in the deal just money wise, and then I would include definitely include Romeo and picks. Uh, I. I don't know if you can include Rob just because then we don't really have a center. <laughs> uh, I would be loath to include Neesmith, but uh, objectively, it probably would be worthwhile to include him. Subjectively, absolutely not. Uh, he's completely <laughs> untouchable. Uh, so I would I would put together a pretty competitive package for, for Grant because I think he is a really, really good fit. Yeah, I, th- I think whether we're talking about Zach Levine, Jeremy Grant, or Bradley Beal. You know, the the most challenging part of of thinking about any of these guys to add to the current roster is you've got to get you've got to give to receive, right? right? And I you know, I see a lot of, of of folks not even just in the sub, but even in just general media and they're talking about well, if if Neesmith plays well, you're not going to want to trade him. Well, if he plays well, that makes him a more viable trade option. Like no right. one's going to want to, you know, trade an established star for someone that's not even showing the potential to be a, a viable Bench role player, player in, yeah. in a rotation. Um, that's why in, in one of my recent posts, I was referencing Peyton Pritchard's a guy that I think is kind of primed to be a trade asset this particular year. You know, if, yeah. if Dennis Schroeder works out and isn't a train wreck, um, you know, I don't see us trading. If that's going well, I don't see us trading him at the deadline and then putting Peyton into that role who has a completely different skill set and strength, weakness sort of paradigm. No doubt. You're kind of, you'd almost be retooling the whole team if you do something like that. Whereas, you know, Peyton's shown enough to this point that, you know, he's a viable backup for someone looking for a, a, a you know, a guard that can stretch the floor. He can give you effort. He can handle the ball. Um, he can get into the paint. He can dish. He's not going to be a lockdown defender. Um, but oftentimes in that backup guard role, you don't always need that. You can pair him with a, another guard uh, that is maybe going to be able to help hide those defensive deficiencies a little bit. So he's a commodity. Um, mm-hmm. So whereas a lot of folks I know are, are talking about, you know, well, if the young guys play well, you got to hold on to them. I'm thinking, you know, some of these young guys, if they play well, they might be playing themselves right into a bigger role on another team. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, we don't really have room for Romeo and Neesmith. So if they both play well, it makes sense to trade, especially if we're bringing back Grant, who's another wing. I mean, it makes sense to include one of them and just find like a scrap heap wing that can be your fifth wing. Uh, so I be that I think that's a great point and something that gets lost. And uh, we have like this ownership of the young guys, like oh, there are dudes. I have it. Like I fuck, I've written like five thousand words on Aaron Neesmith, man. I don't want to trade him, but <laughs> push come to shove, I'd forget about him pretty quick when Jeremy Grant's throwing down alley oops from the Jays. So uh, I I don't want to take too much too much time because again, you know, it's slow news right now. Um, and I I don't want us to go too much longer here but uh you know we've had a a pretty nice weekend in uh in celtics land here a lot of really great things uh for celtics players being honored and recognized in the nba community uh specifically i'm talking about paul pierce getting inducted into that hall of fame congratulations uh paul pierce (laughs) true to his style as a player was no more graceful at that Hall of Fame podium than he ever was on the court. Uh, but in the truest of Paul Pierce expressions, he was, as he always has been, the truth up there. Uh, did yeah. you get a chance to see his Hall of Fame induction speech? And what were your thoughts? At Pierce's was actually the only one I saw out and watched. I don't for whatever reason, I doesn't the hall of fame stuff. I just never really catch it. It doesn't interest me. I don't know why. Um, it's probably some deep physiological thing or a psychological thing I have wrong with me, but, uh, I did watch Pierce's. I absolutely loved it. I think you're, you're spot on, man. It was just like oozing his personality. Uh, my favorite part was when he's like, thank you to Danny Ainge. I thought he was going to, I thought Danny was going to trade me when he showed up. He was trading everybody, <laughs> Antoine, everybody. It's like, yeah, that's Danny. <laughs> so my favorite moment <laughs> was 
was when he singled out Doc and spoke to when he realized Doc was a player's coach. He's like, you know, I knew Doc was a player's coach when I showed up one day for practice and I'm hungover as hell and I'm falling on one knee and Doc comes up to me and he's like, Paul, take your ass home and get right. Get some rest. Come back ready to play tonight. And I knew then. Doc was a player's coach. Doc's over there, like hiding his face. He was mortified. (laughs) Mortified. Come on, man. (laughs) But that's Paul. Like Paul is unapologetically always going to be real, which is maybe why it didn't work out great for him in the ESPN (laughs) ranks because they're not really about that realness. No, Um, they are not. You know, it it just a lot of people playing into aesthetic characters as opposed to natural and organic characters. And and Paul has just always been for better or for worse throughout his entire career in Boston himself. He has yep. always been himself. Um, and he's, and the other thing is like, he's always taken responsibility for himself as well. Uh, and that's one of the things I think we've always grown always as a fan base, been able to grow and appreciate about Paul Pierce and so I, I, I loved, I loved his speech. I, I loved how he had the lean going with it too. He's like looking yep. over to KG while he's making inside jokes that like the only the two of them really totally get. And everyone's just kind of like laughing along with it is just, is a wonderful moment. Um, as well with all that, we also got to uh, see Bill Russell get inducted as a coach, which makes him now one of five that are in the hall of fame as both players and coaches three of which are Celtics. So Bill Russell's one. Do you know who the other two Celtics are? Uh, so I know one is Tommy because he's in as a player, a coach, and a broadcaster. Rest, uh, and in, I bl- peace. Uh, Rest in power, Tommy. RIP, R- Tommy. Uh, and the other, I believe, is Bill Sharman. And I ding, know that. Ding, ding, And I know that because I checked the run sheet earlier. <laughs> 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 and it was on there. <laughs> I tried I tried to white it out before you got in there so that I could try to keep it a secret, but listen, lesson learned, lesson learned. Yeah. So yeah, Bill Russell now one of three Celtics to have been inducted into the Hall of Fame as both a player and a coach. And then Mike Gorman got some recognition over the weekend as well, receiving the Kurt Gowdy Electronic Media Award. So we got to see a lot of cool interviews and and excerpts and some stories that he told from, uh, you know, some of the highlights that he had throughout his career. That man, he's a guy that I could listen to talk until the day I die. All Agreed. right. Um, and I know Ben's a big fan as well. So, you know, shout out to, to Ben. Cause I know Ben, I think if there's a, a, a list of like top three to five guests that Ben wants to have on this show, I know Mike. in that top three, Mike Gorman's got to be up there. So it's at some point, Anyone listening that has any connections or ways to reach out to Mike, let him know. Like we, we'd love to hear more stories that you've got to share. Um, Cause it really, it's a, it's a special treat. He's seen so much um, even before he got to the Celtics, his story is completely fascinating. There's the 30 for 30 about the big East that he's a big feature part of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's amazing. So a lot of warm fuzzies all the way around That's right. for, uh, for Celtics nation. To uh to close us out, uh you know you've been dropping some fresh content in the sub this week regarding Jalen Brown and his potential to ascend to another level of star performance in the upcoming season. Part one of that was titled "A Look at Last Year," uh and it's posted in the sub currently. It's a great read, setting up for a fascinating look at that other foundational pillar of potential Celtics success. What's the word on part two? When's that dropping? I'm going to try. So I'm going on vacation next week. I'm going to the beach. Uh, so I'm going to try. And, I know. I've been watching um, almost. I'm probably about halfway through every turnover Jalen Brown committed last season. Uh, <laughs> so I'm putting together uh, a compilation of some of his worst uh, for that piece. So I hope to have it written and out by the end of this week. But we'll see. Um, my Neesmith piece was featured in. Uh, Celtics blog linked it in their daily links and the dunked Ooh. on guys. Yeah. Included another, the first part of my knee Smith piece and some of their daily links. So it's been a big week for Wayne Spoonie's uh, writing this week. That's a uh, straight big, to the top. That's, yeah. That, that's, that's a big spoonful of, uh, of notoriety that's that you right. got now. Yeah. yeah. All right. Huge. Wayne, uh, the big Spoonie yeah. coming up. <laughs> no, it's, it was cool though to, to see, you know, get noticed by people who are that, 
you know, well-known in the industry. So I was honestly really hum- humbling and I may print out the tweet uh, and and frame it of the tweet of uh, <laughs> Danny LaRue tweeting my my handle on Twitter. <laughs> you should, man. You know, it's 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 evident, I think, to the, the audience, especially in the sub that you're putting a lot of you know attention and effort into creating quality original content for, you know, that community. And now that you're able to start sharing that to a, a, a bigger audience, I, you know, I hope that I speak for the rest of the sub. I know I speak for the rest of the Celtics Reddit podcast team when I say, Yo, go chase them flowers, man. Go get them. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Jay. (laughs) All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're listening, make sure to like, subscribe, rate, and review so that we can continue to bring you Celtics discussion that you enjoy. You can look out for our podcast in video format as well on YouTube. We're currently being hosted by the Celtics highlight goat himself, Timmy093. And you can look for all those links in the post description. You can also follow the pod on Twitter at Celtics Reddit Pod. I'm on Twitter as well at Celtics J6. Spoons, where can the people find you and get more of your work? Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at W Spoonie, all one word. And I also uh, have been trying to con- consolidate all my writing onto Medium. So I'm just Wayne underscore Spoonie on Medium. And you can eventually will be able to find everything I've written on there and all my new stuff I'm posting there first and then putting it on the sub a little bit later. All right, man. Well, listen, encouraging everybody to be on the lookouts for that. We certainly enjoy and appreciate all of your work. Uh, Once again, for the Celtics Reddit podcast team, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys next time.